Welcome back to Live at the Museum. We're here with a special suite of Reconciliation Week programs this week. My name's Penny. I'm from the Lifelong Learning Team here at the National Museum, and I'm here today with our Senior Indigenous Curator and Head of the Indigenous Knowledges Centre, Margot Ning. We're going to be talking about the Old Masters Exhibition, which was on display here at the National Museum in 2013. But before we get underway, I would like to, as always, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're filming today, the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. I would like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and also extend that consideration to any and all First Nations people watching and also present, which gives me a very nice segue to reintroduce Margot, our Senior Indigenous Curator. Uh, can you well, can you tell us a little bit about you, Margot, and how you fit into the museum? Thank you, Penny. Um, yes, well, I have pieces of furniture, really. I've been here since birth, that is the birth of the museum on this site uh, in 2000. Um, but, of course, many different roles along the way. I was the inaugural director of the Gallery of First Australians and... Um, obviously a senior Indigenous curator which has now morphed into the Indigenous um, Knowledge Centre. Mm. Um, I'm also a Koori from Gippsland with Aboriginal and Irish ancestry and I have um, a strong Goombanga connection. Beautiful. So before we get on to talking about Old Masters, we have a little bit of footage that was uh, created for the exhibition back in 2013. Before we screen it, I would just like to let everybody know that this video includes the names and images of people that are deceased, and this may cause sadness or distress to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers. This exhibition is leading a way for us to see the Yolngu world of telling message. The role of the bark was, it's, it's, an, it's a way of not, not the telling stories, but through the images of animals and through the images of you know, anything what was drawn on the bark. It was educational. Uh, Tom Jawa's painting was uh, something very special. I, as the son, I'm a son of Jawa, and I'm really pleased to have Jawa's painting on the, on the uh, exhibition. I remember him sitting under the tamarind tree, doing the painting. Same, same, I was doing same paintings, or you know, there were other paintings. If he he would be here present, uh, yes, like you know, he would be you know so pleased. Emu on this this painting here um, has been picked for the master's display. Emu was very important to Jawa. Um, this is his dream, and, and he's got a story for that. Um, there's some few emus walking across to the lakes to feed in the afternoon or first thing in the morning. He mapped the place. This is the mapping area, and this is the Google Watch. It's like a Google today. And it's like mapping, looking at, uh, from above us is the satellite when you look down. They were doing this in their own minds and thought. And the drawing here is emu and the uh, footprints going up and down to, to, to the water holes at Lake Abella today. Painting the crabs, Jawa did that. Um, he
he is a Jungaya or he is a child of the crab people. So he allowed to play, uh, play a part in that and draw his mother people's clan. And he drew this crab. They were going in and out from the fresh water to the salt water. I hope this exhibition will help educate lots of people. Uh, I think it will be some sort of a key, key ways, a key, key to the door. We have to start educate children for paintings like these ones. Uh, hopefully a lot of people will go, probably the students will come along and have a look too. Um, this is not for Yolngu people only, or you know, for the country. This is for the rest of Australia. Let's think about the, those people, you know, before us, everybody, whether you're Balanda or Yolngu, black or white, you know. Let's think about those people who had done a great thing for Australia. Somebody, you know, who had done really great thing for this country. And this is the time, I think, you know, we, we're gonna start looking at what Australians, we're gonna put, Australians have to put an effort on this country to support this country with many things. And I think that's the, it'll be the iconic, I think, the icon for people to have a look at that. Old Masters was actually one of the first exhibitions that I got to work on here at the National Museum as part of that project team. Um, and I found it really interesting. Can you, um, for me, again, as a refresh and for everybody watching at home, talk about how it was different to previous exhibitions of Bach paintings that had been at the museum or at other institutions? Love to. Well, the Bach painting, it was actually recast, particularly to give it a contemporary view and to sort of bring into the mould of contemporary art because previously it had be, always been seen, or Bach exhibitions always been seen as ethnographic, um, cultural artefact, um, and not actually being of, of a you know, contemporary nature. Well, clearly, clearly they predate contemporary art and they are contemporary, they're done of the day. And so there's many attempts at recasting. In fact, I have a... Just to show you the look of it, you would never have seen an Aboriginal art bark exhibition that had that kind of clarity, and they certainly look contemporary in appearance, which is not to take away the fact that they are ancient and they are cultural. That's fabulous. Now, um, I know that you've worked in, in Arnhem Land for a while. Are there particular pieces in this exhibition that you resonate with, or mm. were there people that you had particular yeah. preferences for working with? Yeah, well, I lived in Arnhem Land most of the 70s. Um, really when the bark painting as a collectible was taking off. So a lot of the artists and the makers, as they're called in the exhibition, I knew in person. I lived in the camps with them. I also learned to do bark painting from them. I spoke language and so on. So when I see some of these works, it really is like catching up with my old mates. Uh, and, and so I'm quite, I have a lived in relationship with the works and the artists rather than as something I've seen on a wall or collected in a museum. So one that does come to mind is particularly interesting is David, is done by David Malungi. There's several in here because it's actually done along schools of art lines, um, which means in Indigenous Aboriginal world, um, it means, um, like schools of art, thus the, this, the play on the old masters is a linguistic appropriation. So here's, here's the work by David Malungi. Now David Malungi, it, it, some may or may not remember, but this is in fact the design that was used on the dollar bill when the currency came in in 1966. So interestingly enough, a lot of people have been carrying David Malungi's Gunmaringu story in their pocket for um, some time now, of course, the dollar bill is not uh, in vogue, but it's a real it, it, couple of things in terms of what we're talking about. One is you clearly see this very contemporary, lyrical, rhythmical, 
composition that you may not see in other bark paintings that a much more heavy set. Um, and it tells the story, as many do, of life, birth, death, creation. And you've got this fabulous, you know, cherry, tr cherry tree here. And it's like many of these stories. They're about, they're like the Book of Genesis or they're like the Iliad Odyssey um, or the, you know, the Bible. They, it's from a non-literate, uh, not a non-literate, definitely literate visually in other ways, but a non-text-based society. So here's where the stories, the books, the archives and the knowledge lives in these bark paintings. And very quickly, in this case, Gun Moringu, a big hunter, was told not to go at this particular site where there was a, a water hole with a poisonous snake. He misbehaved, broke the rules, got stung by the snake and consequently died. Thus, the, uh, they had to design a mortuary ceremony being the first for the Gunmuringu people. So, as you can see, it also resonates with the Adam and Eve um, story of misadventure in the Garden of Eden. So it also has a lot of the morals. But I just think it's... And also, David Malangi got a... You know, not only the dollar bill thing, but he got a doctorate and he became quite a distinguished person in both worlds. Um, so you mentioned that while we were contemporising, I don't know if that's a word, if you uh, want to dictionary.com that for me, people, on the live stream, <laughs> please feel free. Also, uh, f don't forget to pop your questions in because we would really like to hear from you. Um, back to my initial question, uh, I was talking about the, is there a, a tension between cultural art practice and commercial art practice? Uh, in, in Arnhem Land or even sort of more widely in Indigenous art? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the word art is a Western term um, and that comes along with the word of the concept of commercialisation. So all the, all the sorts of bark paintings you see here never looked like that before, right? They are painted for an outside audience. So, so clearly there's nothing in there or they're not painted in any kind of way that is not allowed to be seen by an outside audience. So the, since the 70s, and all these paintings are from of 48 to 88, um, and the first lot of people who collected them were actually anthropologists uh, who were collecting for the purpose of study, uh, and they were still going outside the cultural group, so there was also sensitivity and culture was taken into account, but not as removed as it is now. Oh, I don't mean cultures removed, I mean things that shouldn't be seen. Uh, and, and then in the 70s, there was a bit of a boom, and collectors started coming in, the bark got bigger, they got slicker, they got smoother, they accorded to the taste of the marketplace. There have been instances where there have been transgressions, either by you know, an individual or a group of people who didn't get that their works that they were producing didn't just go to the their best friend, white anthropologist, but in fact was going to be hung on a gallery wall. So there were, so what happened in some cases, like the desert cases, people learned how to um, veil the, the more significant or secret parts with dots, or they would turn figurative elements into um, symbols that only they could read. Ah, changing semiotics. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things I did find really interesting about the Old Masters exhibition um, was that there was only one female artist uh, featured in the exhibition. Is that because bark painting is men's business or is there sort of another reason for that? Well, you know, it's historic. Um, traditionally, um, it's not men's business in that sense. Men's business is more associated with stuff that isn't women's business and in a more ceremonial sense. Uh, in bark painting, I think one of the interesting things about it is that for the first, you know, the anthropologists went to Arnhem Land and other places in Aboriginal Australia were male. And so the men worked with the men and the men told the men the stories. That sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> and the women, of course, wouldn't talk to a men be outside about their business. So there was an assumption that Aboriginal women didn't have ceremonial, ritual, sacred, interesting, anything that an anthropologist would want to pursue or study, even if they talked to them. 
And then the second thing is that um, when the market became, so in the 70s, there was an interest and the became, collectors came on in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Um, the men, particularly the men in Arnhem Land, particularly North East Arnhem Land, couldn't keep up, couldn't supply the demand. So they enlisted, as old masters do, their apprentices, who happened to be their wives and their daughters and sisters. So they would, you know, it's just like Reuben's workshop, the old masters uh, they, they create the, the visionaries of school who have the knowledge and they bring in the apprentices and as also happens, the apprentices became very skillful at this practice and they start producing their own work with the support of the old masters and, um, and if you looked at the marketplace now you'd find a significant number of females who participate in bark painting and allied products like the hollow log coffins and I was going to say good, and I actually I will say good. I was I was <laughs> second guessing myself, but no, good. I would. I, I, it's nice to see art from sort of both sides of that uh, gender spectrum. We're starting to get some questions coming in from the audience. Alana would like to know: Will this exhibition be displayed in Australia again? I don't know if you have control of that, Margot. Well, I have a lot of control sometimes, but <laughs> um, look, you can't tell. It was very popular. This going overseas to be shown in other places and so that means that if it's on the move there's no reason why it may not just pop up in Australia. So, but no definitive answer because that's a sort of a scheduling yes, um, situation beyond my control. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for another couple of questions to come in, can I ask, uh, Jo Mula mentioned Balanda? Yes. Ba Balanda. What, what is Balanda? Well, Joe Gumbler, who you've just seen on that footage, interestingly enough, is, um, was a student of mine in, when I lived in Manangrida, very, and he also got an honorary doctorate along the way, so I did like to mention that, and Tim, Tom Jower, who's in the catalogue, we have it, is his father. Um, Balanda means um, white fella, and it's ostensibly come from the word Hollander. Now think about Arnhem Land. Arnhem's come from the Dutch, there's a place called Arnhem, and they've probably heard, <coughs> you know, we're Hollanders, we're from Hollanders, so Ballander has, has come out of that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I think we have a budding artist on the line. Uh, Shakri would like to know how the barks are prepared for painting. Actually, I'd be really interested to yeah. know about this too. Well, interestingly enough, um, I was an art teacher in a number of these places in Arnhem Land, and I thought, what better art shop to go to than the bush? So we'd head bush regularly with the old fellas and we would you basically ring bark a tree. Um, <coughs> very trees that only they know are ripe by tapping with enough moisture. You'd bring off the bark, put it on a hot, on a fire, smoky, rocky fire, straighten it out over a week and then you would grab, get some ochres and the river from the earth, grind them uh, these days with... Um, Aquid here basically to make the ochre stick, uh, and then these days you may use um, commercial brushes. But then, even when I was there, we used to just get hair, you can get any thickness you want, really, preferably straight hair, and then you'd tie it onto a twig with a bit of, sti a bit of um, string, and then you'd grind your paint, you'd drag your hair brush through, and that's how you get those beautiful, slick lines in the cross hatching or you get a twig and you chew on the end of it till it's all fluffy and ragged and and then paint it's a very sustainable art practice very isn't sustainable. it I'm, uh, although i remember getting in lots of trouble from my mum for making hairbrushes out of my fringe when i was a kid i oh. could just say that clearly i was um Ahead of your channel time. yeah channeling um <laughs> some of our indigenous people um now I'm, I'm going to ask this question even though having been at the museum for a while I sort of know the answer to it, um, but I know that some people might be wondering where are the dot paintings in the Old Masters exhibition? Well, dot paintings have, has become a sort of a term for paintings from the desert. So invariably it's acrylic on canvas and that probably grew out of that idea of trying to veil the stuff that shouldn't be seen, the important, significant, secret stuff. 
and then it became associated in the marketplace with works that come from the desert. Now, there are dots, you know. I mean, the desert people didn't invent dots, clearly, because there was dots and marks on the bodies. So when you do dance in front of the fire, there's flickering and therefore spirituality. In the same, you get the same in, in dots on bodies and dots in barks, but the concept, as you say, the branding of dot paintings is very much a desert art thing. So they're not going to be in a bark painting. Because bark painting is primarily Northern Territory. Northern Territory and, the, and yep. dots of the desert Different regions. Because we're not a monoculture. We are definitely <laughs> very not. <laughs> um, David would like to know what are the colours used, ochre or pigments? Um, well, the ochres are pigments. Sorry to I say. think he means maybe <laughs> synthetic pigments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's a okay, question so, about the um, No, I, I actually get material? the question. Yeah. Um, they're not manufactured Western pigments. Ochres come in, you know, um, red ochre. And you might see when you've gone bush yourself, you rub certain rocks, they'll release a pigment. And it's red ochre or it's yellow ochre. And sometimes we used to get it from the, um, the kaolin, the white, from the river edges of the river banks. It's the same kaolin that is in diarrhoea medicine. Um, so that's the white part. And then the black is the ash part. So in a way, they're all pigments, but not Western, you know, synthetic They're not like pigments. a cochineal or a um, cadmium white or yes, yes. something like that. You can mix those colours yeah. and get secondary colours. Ah, thank you, Isabel. Contemporising is a word. I'm not making it up. I'm very glad to hear that. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's nice having a whole raft of fact checkers happening over there. Uh, are, we, um, are we still getting a couple of questions through? I think we've got um, from the studio. Oh, no, this is interesting. So what does being crab people mean? Um, it means... If you heard of the word totem or dreaming, people have a dream. I've got a grandson called Marandu and his dreaming is Goanna and Marandu means Goanna. And if you extrapolate that across, it means he has a particular responsibility to care for the Goanna. So all people have relationships with all other animals, right? So when you get to... When you get to um, Crabs, Jawa, Tom Jawa, in the movie you just saw, who, who uh, his bark, you saw his son talking, uh, means if I'm a crab person, I belong to the crab clan and that's my particular totem and it's my responsibility to think and care about the increase of crabs. It's my identification, my identity. Okay. Thank you very much for elaborating on that because we, we, we hear these terms sort of broadly, and some of us have a very uh, pop culture understanding of what a, what a totem might be, but it's really nice to hear yeah. somebody sort of go a little bit more in depth. Um, L.P. Hall, the artist spoke of the painting as looking at satellite images, um, and the idea was to teach, map, like teaching map reading at school. Uh, do, are there any particular paintings in the exhibition or maybe just that you're aware of that would be really interesting for somebody to use talking about the difference between indigenous maps and, and Western maps? Now, is it, was, I wonder whether... Because I think... Was, I the think artist, looking, was it Joe Gumbula who spoke? Yeah, Joe was talking oh. about that, yeah. Well, what, what, that, what that is, is the idea of when an uh, Aboriginal artist from the desert, it's even more, more obvious, but in the anywhere on remote regions, regions in particular, their knowledge of their country, which is a particular region, area, is so intimate. They have such an intimate knowledge. You walk over 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of your life, so you have an intimate knowledge as you do of the map of your house or your house to school. This is a map, so there's a very aerial view of... of the features and lay and lie of the land, which is then seen as associated with different animals forming them. So um, the desert, the desert art in particular seems to be more obviously aerial. But Aboriginal art invariably is aerial, but they always show the most characteristic angles. So if it's a kangaroo, it'll be in profile. If it's a goanna, 
it'll be an aerial view. But if it's of land, it'll certainly be, and it's all map making. It's all, not cartographic necessarily, but um, a sort of a moral type of map making. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, LP wants to know if some of these are okay to use in the classroom. Some of these if paintings? They the, yeah, I think talking about map making. I was actually going to mention there mm. is a painting in the Old Masters exhibition called Sydney from the yes, Air. Yes, yes, yes. And that would probably be a really good one to use in the classroom because it's got the coast on it and it's got houses and roads and, and things like that if you yeah. want to sort of talk about that idea of being from the air. Um, we still have questions streaming in and I'm really sorry we're not going to get to everybody's questions so I think we have time for one maybe two like really super fast questions. Uh, you mean super um, fast answers? Oh well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no super fast answers. We're going to go in depth. <laughs> okay. no. uh, Julianne wants to know what's the difference between urban and desert artists? Well it's just... That's a big question. It's, no, it's, it, it, it's, it is but it isn't. Uh, it's a good question. It's discerning. Uh, uh, desert artists are basically those who live in the desert. Mm. Urban artists are those who live in urban areas. Mm. And of course, if you live in an urban area, then you are Aboriginal people who have been more impacted by the colonising process and therefore you've had to dynamically change the way you run your culture. And invariably urban-based artists or city and rural city country-based artists around the fringes of the eastern fringes of Australia invariably go to art school. Okay. Whereas the desert artists just learn from each other in the desert. They're not going to learn desert art or desert dot painting so it's kind of at art school. Think about different influences because you, yeah. you mentioned that often the artwork is a, a response to identity so you Naturally, if you're a remote artist or a rural artist, you're mm. going to have different influences mm. coming in. So it's a very different you. being Aboriginal is just a, is a is quite a generic term because those who live in the desert who may speak language, ceremony, you know, um, and entirely and they pass knowledge on in that way and not through formal institutions. Mm. Those in the southern or colonised parts of Australia obviously are more integrated into a Western world but define their, their identity differently. That's actually a bit of the work of the Indigenous Knowledge Centre, isn't it? Yes, it is. Margot, yeah. sort of looking at the different ways that knowledge is, is, is passed yeah. through Indigenous people. Um, so, uh, I'm going to have to call it quits. I'm really sorry, guys. Um, if you're not watching live, so if you're watching this later, or if we haven't got to your question, please pop it in the public comments under the video. If you just leave it in the live comments, it'll disappear once we stop going live. So chuck it in the public comments and we will get back to you. And uh, before we head off, I would like to leave you with a preview of next week's program, which is on the Essendon Milk Cart with uh, curator Laura Cook and conservator Karen Wagg. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Here we are among the carcoons. This is my favourite object, the Lincoln Park Dairy milk wagon. This is a 1940s milk wagon which was used by the Thai family who were the proprietors of the Lincoln Park Dairy in Essendon. When the cart came to the museum, it had been dismantled and was in the hundreds of pieces and six months to put the puzzle back together and have it ready in time for exhibition.